What is the government of Bhutan doing to protect its environment and forests in terms of policies and concrete actions? Could you please tell me a bit about it? We have already in our constitution a full chapter dedicated to environmental protection. So in that chapter, the articles uh, you know, provide that we have to maintain at least 60% of our geographical area under forest cover for all times to come. And it also mandates every Bhutanese citizen to be a custodian of the environment and the biodiversity that it carries. Bhutan is a small country and with rapid urbanization comes a typical man versus nature conflict. What are you doing to balance this urbanization and keeping, keeping in mind that the environment has to be taken care of? Well, it works in both ways. You know, because we are fortunate that uh, we still have a relatively small population and uh, with urbanization it is actually offloading people from agriculture to other sectors you know so with urbanization there are also positive benefits so we have more area for the farmers as well as for the animals you know the wildlife included so the forest cover actually has increased because of that you know we have now close to 80 percent under forest cover and that has come about mostly from fellow agriculture lands uh, being taken over by forest cover. After hydropower, agriculture forms a big part of your GDP and climate change obviously has very negative effects on your agriculture. How, how has climate change affected agriculture? Could you give me some instances and what are you doing to counter the effect? Yes, it is uh, beginning to show and we have already felt you know, uh, the, the impacts of climate change. For example, I was mentioning the unseasonal rainfall pattern so rains do not come when they are expected. So when the farmers are ready to sow their fields or plant their rice, uh, the rains do not occur as they did in the past. Uh, similarly, when they finish harvesting and the harvested crops are lying on the ground, suddenly the rains come and often destroys the entire harvest. So we have to cope with that kind of mechanism. Plus uh, things like windstorms, events like windstorms, uh, rainstorms are occurring more frequently than in the past. And of course the biggest uh, threat is from the drying of water sources. The springs are drying up, the streams are drying up, you know, so that is uh, becoming very, you know, sort of uh, worrying for us. What about hydropower? I mean, Bhutan and hydropower are talked about a lot. So what are the big projects that you would say? How is the success rate of projects been? Yes, uh, we have done very well with hydropower and uh, we should know that being a mountainous country, uh, you know, Bhutan's uh, major, I think, most important resource is actually water. Uh, so hydropower is one sector through which we can actually generate revenue for operating our, you know, for financing our welfare schemes, education, health, and also investment in agriculture and other sectors. So we have, at, as of now, we have. Uh, uh, you know, an installed capacity of around 2,000 megawatts, and from that, already 70% are being, uh, you know, ex exported to India. Uh, so, and we are in the process of now developing, uh, you know, uh, uh, several other hydropower plants, and by the year 2020, we are hoping to have an installed capacity of around 10,000 megawatts, and we hope that we would then graduate to being. Uh, economically independent country. Now we, we also realize that uh, most of our rivers actually originate from glacial lakes. The glaciers are melting very fast. So the sustainability of water flow in our rivers also comes under you know, scrutiny. So we feel that we have to invest in other forms of renewable energy. So we are looking at an energy basket, particularly at the community level, you know, looking at biogas, you know, even uh, yeah. biofuels, uh, solar, wind, and particularly at micro hydros at the community level. You just signed an MOU with Norway, orchestrated by the Asian Development Bank. Could you tell me a bit about the treaty? Norway, of course, as you know, is one of the you know most advanced countries as far as renewable energy is concerned, and Norway has been also actively involved in helping Bhutan. Uh, in terms of providing the expertise uh, and resources to develop our energy sector. So it is only natural that uh, Norway has expressed interest and has come forward to support this initiative 
of our energy basket, you know, helping us to develop appropriate policies, plans and also the resources to implement them. And of course, uh, it is called Energy Plus Partners. So ADV has come forward as a partner to Norway. So this would really make a big difference in terms of securing the, you know, the, the energy required uh, by our communities in the future. Tourism plays a big part in Bhutan's economy. Tourism gets in a lot of money, but at the same time has really damaging effects on the environment. What are you doing to ensure a balance is there? Right. Now, Bhutan has opted to pursue a green economic development plan, which means our options are rather limited. So with hydropower, the export of energy from our hydropower plants, we would be able to earn a lot of uh, revenue. But this revenue has to translate into real incomes and employment. Uh, to the average Bhutanese citizen. Now, for that to happen, we have to invest in other sectors. So, if you compare across the options that we have, then tourism is one sector that has the potential to spread the benefits across across the cross sections of our society, from drivers uh, to the travel agents to the farmers, uh, you know, uh, the hoteliers and so on. So, a lot of jobs can be created and the income spread. Uh, can be, you know, uh, achieved uh, across the board, as I was mentioning. So we have uh, highlighted tourism as one of the sectors uh, that we should prioritize. And not tourism in the sense uh, that we would be going for, you know, large-scale mass tourism, if you like. We would be looking at uh, ecotourism, uh, managed nature tourism, and, uh, you know, adventure tourism, uh, uh, cultural tourism and so on. So our policy in tourism is uh, high value, low impact. Uh, so with that, you know, approach, we would be able to manage the, the you know, reduce the kind of uh, negative impacts that tourism would otherwise have on our nature and our culture. Bhutan as a nation is trying to make it big on the world economic stage. What are the primary challenges that Bhutan faces? Of course, uh, we have become a democratic nation. We have uh, embraced democracy. So with democracy, it comes, uh, you know, comes many challenges also. And one of those challenges is the increased aspirations, the needs and wants of uh, the people. So balancing their needs, their wants, with the national interests and national priorities is becoming increasingly difficult. And in many cases, you know, politically, it's quite difficult to take hard decisions. So we would not need, we'll, we would need to make sure that in future we have governments that can take hard decisions, that are committed to the national interest, to upholding the philosophy of gross national happiness, which seeks to balance the material growth, the material uh, aspects of development with the spiritual aspects. GNH has been discussed as a concept ad nauseum in the media and all over the world. But according to you, why do you think it's not been adopted by other countries, despite it being such a proven good concept? Well, again, I think it's not something that uh, we prescribe, you know, for everyone to follow. It's up to the nation states concerned to see which aspects of gross national happiness uh, are useful to them, relevant to them. Now, in Bhutan's case, uh, we, I think, uh, embrace this philosophy, we embrace this approach, firstly, because we had a visionary leader in our fourth king, His Majesty Chikmisinghi Wongchu, who felt that income is not the only, you know, indicator of development. That income doesn't, alone doesn't make uh, people happy or wiser or healthier. You know, we need good environment besides uh, income. We need to, you know, have a good culture, good cultural values, uh, you know, harmony in society, and of course, uh, we need to have uh, good governance. Without having political stability, without having values, and without having a good environment where we can have clean air, clean water, you know, green, have, you know, forests, animals, birds, you know, income alone, you know, uh, doesn't constitute, uh, you know, a good life. How has the experience been at the DSTs 2013 till now? Well, uh, it's good in the sense that we, you know, hear many things, many, some new, some uh, the same, you know, 
stories uh, and again but uh, it provides us a platform uh, for sharing experiences for also meeting people and uh, you know uh, you know the exposure uh, to new ideas and innovations uh, from around the globe thank you so much sir it was a pleasure talking to you thank you very much thank you very much thank you.